I gonna build? Oh, hey, what's this? Hey, that's pretty cool. Vintage Dragon 5C Firefly. Hmm, I do have tracks for it. Maybe this will be the next one. Wait a minute. <sighs> All right. Finally, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks for watching. Ha, huh. looks like I could now finally get to this one. Let's do this. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale British Sherman 5C Firefly. This model here is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these model showcase videos, I often take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. This mall here is built predominantly out of the box, however, during the construction I went ahead and upgraded it further, utilizing several aftermarket components, as well as scratch building a few others. We'll be going over all of these additions, modifications, as well as reviewing the base starter kit in this video. So stay tuned because there's going to be a lot of info flying right at you. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle here is the British 5C Firefly. The 5C Firefly was a British upgrade to the M4 Sherman family, where the vehicle was upgunned, replacing the standard American 75mm gun with the British 17-pounder. As we all know, the Sherman had a lot of benefits to it during the war, but one of the aspects where it was limited specifically from 1943 and onward was with its firepower. The 75mm gun was not really going to be able to penetrate the more advanced German tanks which were coming onto the scene and which were being encountered at the front, typically the Panther and the Tiger. All throughout the war, both the Americans and the British were trying to come up with a way to give the Sherman more firepower. The British went ahead and dabbled a little bit on their own and they developed a way to mount their anti-tank gun 17 pounder inside of the Sherman turret. This did require a few modifications to be made but the conversion was one that can be done and can be done in a viable manner. In order to do the conversion the standard American 75 millimeter rotor and mantlet were replaced with two new revised units developed by the Brits. This new system was able to mount on their 17 pounder gun. Other modifications were also made to the turret, namely to the rear bustle area. On the standard American vehicle, the rear bustle is where a radio would be housed. On the British vehicle, in order to adapt it further, they went ahead and removed the American radio. They cut out a portion of the rear turret and fastened a brand new box that was secured to the rear portion of the turret. This new section housed the British pattern radio, but it also acted as a counterweight because it was deemed that without this counterweight system fitted, the extra length of the 17-pounder was going to cause problems when it came time to rotate the turret. In order to get better access into the interior, the Brits designed their own loader's hatch modification, where they would cut away a portion of the turret roof and fabricate their own hatch system out of sections of steel. One of the other modifications that was needed to have been made to the Sherman involved the hull. You see, with the 17-pounder ammunition, they were much longer compared to the original ammunition that the tank was designed around. In order to get more ammunition to fit inside of the vehicle, the radio operator's position, which on a Sherman would also include the bow gun, was sacrificed in order to have that area of the hull be equipped with extra ammunition magazines. Because of this, all of the interior fittings over there were gutted out and the bow 1919 was replaced and in order to cover this section up, a large solid steel block was welded to the front portion of the hull. Finally, the last modification that was made by the Brits was a new design travel lock which was typically located in the rear portion of the vehicle. This would change depending on when the vehicles were built, but by and large the British design of travel lock was much different compared to the one seen on standard American design Shermans. 
And that's really all that was done to upgrade the tanks to Firefly. Automotively, the vehicle stayed exactly the same, and no other changes were made in that regard. The British made a large number of these Firefly converted tanks, and the majority of them seemed to be vehicles based on what the British called the Sherman 5. The Sherman 5 is the British designation for the American M4A4 Sherman, which as we know is the extended hull variant of the Sherman that utilized the Chrysler multi-bank engine. The Firefly program proved to be a very successful conversion and was utilized to great effect by the British from 1943 onward to the end of the war. The vehicles were very successful and are credited for knocking out a good number of German tanks. The US Army experimented a little bit with a couple test examples of the Firefly and even at one point of the war had a small batch of Fireflies that were being used actively in Europe but that's really a conversation for another video. Of course the British Army was the largest user of the Firefly during the war but the Commonwealth countries received these vehicles as well. Post World War II the Fireflies were still remaining in service with a large number of countries, and this continued all the way up until probably the mid-1970s. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when this model was first started to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this vintage Dragon Sherman 5C Firefly kit. This particular kit is kit number 6031. This particular model is a relatively new addition to the stash. I picked it up off of eBay eh, about a year or a year and a half ago, so it hasn't been sitting here for very long. And as you can see, the box isn't exactly as crusty as some of the other ones that have showed up here on the channel. This was one of those kits that I actually went ahead and specifically went out to look for because it's one of those models that I remember seeing from my childhood and was one of those builds that I always wanted to tackle, but for one reason or another, I kept away from it. Which will definitely be seen as soon as I crack open the box and if anyone is a frequent viewer of the channel you'll probably guess why I kept away from these kits for the longest time. This kit here is interesting in its own right because this was the very first 135th scale plastic kit of a Sherman Firefly in any flavor. Prior to this kit here, if you were looking to model a rendition of the Sherman Firefly in 135th scale, your selections were basically non-existent. These kits here date back to 1994, and during this time, Dragon was really starting to expand their AFV kit lineup. See, Dragon was a newcomer to the industry, and the first batch kits they released were in the early 1990s, and they primarily released a lot of modern armor, or Soviet period armor as well. Around the periods that came after that, namely from 1992 and onward, they really started to develop a World War II kit lineup, and this would be known as their 135, 39 to 45 series. This series is still in constant development all the way up to even today, and it is a hallmark of the 135th scale tank market. When this series of kits came out, they were met with great praise from the armor modeling community who were desperately looking for something new and exciting on the market, and the 39 to 45 series really hit this in spades. Just like I've mentioned in many of my other 1990s era vintage kit builds, during this period, the armor modeling market was a fraction of what we see it today, and the variation of kits were also a fraction of what it's been even within the last 10 or so years. The 1990s was really a transitional period for the older legacy plastic model companies. They had a lot of older tooling kits from the 1970s that were still either in production or were being tweaked in one way, shape, form, or another. Or they were just tooling up brand new kits with newer technology and tooling of that period. To put things in perspective, for armor modeling, you really only had three major company options to choose from. You had Tamiya, you had Academy, and you had Italery. The Tamiya kits were either just kits that had been in constant production since the 1970s, or what they would do is they would take their older tooling kit, tweak it around the edges, remove the gearbox, add another runner of parts, give it a new box art, and release it as a new kit in that format. 
or they would just straight up make a new tooling kit altogether, utterly phasing out the old one entirely. When it came to Academy, Academy at this time had a pretty wide range of kits that they basically just jacked from Tamiya. And from this period in the 1990s, you would see them taking the older Tulane kits, tweaking them and modifying them and making them more of their own and releasing them in that type of a format as well. For Tallery, they were actually, I guess, a bit on the lazier end because on a um, vast majority of their kits, they really didn't do anything with the older tooling. They would just basically throw it into a box with a new different type of box art and just release it in that format. Other than that, Italy were also, again, coming up with newer parts for to be used on existing molds that they had of the period. So that was basically what you were working with at that time. This is the type of era where Dragon enters into the field. Dragon enters and they produce kits that were fantastic quality of vehicle types that were completely ignored or non-existent from the other companies that I just mentioned. To sweeten the deal further, the Dragon kits were extremely well detailed. They featured things like cast texturing, weld lines, cast numbers, little subtle details like this which would have either been softer found on the surfaces of the other plastic model company kits or would just not have been existent at all. These would have came standard on these Dragon kits of the period and again even up through today. On top of that, Dragon really was one of the first of the new generation of plastic model companies where they were incorporating new materials on their kits. You would see things like photo etch, resin, metal, these type of components were unheard of to be included in a kit of the past, but on these Dragon kits, they just came with the stock model. So they were very well designed and engineered in that regard. Now for the Shermanaholics out there, again, at this time, your selection was basically abysmal. You had no other options for rendering a vehicle like this. At the period, your options for modeling a Sherman tank were the late production M4A3 from Timia, the 76 millimeter M4A1 from Italeri, along with a Italeri pattern of the M4A3. So between those three options, that was basically all you had. I mean, a lot of guys at the period were cobbling and intermixing the, the three kits together in order to try to get something different, but that was really the only thing to choose from. So when Dragon dropped with this kit here, that was a huge game changer. If you wanted to, for instance, build a Firefly before this kit came out, the only other option available in plastic was a quasi-conversion kit from the company MMP Models. They would have sold a plastic 17-pounder equipped Sherman turret, and they also sold separately a upper and lower hull for the M4A4 Sherman. Outside of MMP, your only other option would be to acquire a turret and hull conversion kit from some resin garage kit company. Now, this was a viable option. However, cast resin is a type of material where if the individual doesn't have a background or a skill set with working with, you're not exactly going to have pleasurable results as opposed to conventional polystyrene kits that the majority of people are used to working with. Well, let's now start with the model's box art. The box art is this compost scene that we have here, and this is quite typical for Dragon kits of the period, and even all the way up to today. One thing Dragon always did have was some pretty nice quality box arts. But the box arts from the 90s period all had this type of look and feel to it since they were basically comprised of the same couple of illustrators. Here we have the Firefly here, dead center. The quality of the illustration is pretty good. The scene consists of a smoldering, knocked out, late production Tiger One, And we have here some rendition of a British Churchill tank in the background. Unfortunately, the, the mark number escapes me. Forgive me, British fan, tank fans out there. But you can probably tell me in the comment section below. Here we have, in the background, just a nice little valley of sorts. And overall, the quality of the box art is nicely rendered. The illustrator is this individual here. Like I said, this individual has done several other of the box arts from this era. Note the Dragon logo is just DML, which is Dragon Models Limited. In the years that came after this, this would be just changed to Dragon. 
And here we have the typography on the top, pretty basic, and tells you everything you need to know. From the box art takes to the side panel, which gives us a nice little snippet, and the green side plate that we have here, typical for Dragon Kiss from the 39 to 45 series with the same type of typography and basic layout. This, this is quite commonly seen. Side panel gives us a built sample of the model. Note, at this period, this was before Dragon started importing the kits themselves under the Dragon USA banner, and instead, the Dragon kits were imported by Marco Polo Imports, which I believe are still in, in business today, but I'm a little hazy on that. However, the older kits of the period would have the Marco Polo Import branding. The other side is exactly the same as the corner, and here on the other side here, we've got some verbiage barcode, and some more Marco Polo info. Cracking open the box to reveal the kit contents, you'll notice that all of the components are molded in the standard gray coloring, which by the way was also unique of the period. Back then, to me, kits are either molded in gray or yellow or green in some cases, and the Tallery kits are very similar. Dragon, nah, you're, you're, you need to paint their model, so they molded them in this simple gray coloring. Also, the plastic composition on these older Dragon kits are slightly different compared to what's seen on their contemporary releases. It's hard to explain. It's one of those things that you just have to feel. If you feel an older kit compared to their newer kits, you'll know exactly what I'm referring to. Now, in the box here, we're going to have a kit which is basically identical to another review that I did a little while ago, which was the Dragon M4A4 Sherman tank. These two kits came out at around the exact same time and basically use the exact same runners and components. The difference being that this kit gives you a few other different sprues in order to build this one as a Firefly, as opposed to the other kit which was designed to be the 75mm equipped Sherman. Starting with this runner here, which is probably the biggest change between the two kits, as this one is the turret. Note this one here is straight up Firefly where we have the square loader satch present. Note the quality of the cast texturing found on this piece. And on this section here, we got this decal sheet out of the way, you can see the other Firefly specific components, namely the 17 pounder gun and the 17 pounder redesigned mantlet. Now, I'm just speculating here, but I think that the molds for the 75 and this kit are exactly the same. Only on the 75 turret mold, I think Dragon has a little drop-in plug for this section over here in order to seal this off in order to just mold the same piece for the 75 millimeter gun. In fact, if you look at those runners on that other video, you'll see a lot of the same parts, only this half of the sprue is just amputated off but you still have components that are Firefly specific, namely the counterweight, which needs to get mounted to the back. In fact, the two holes are found in the back of that turret. So, but that's why I'm just going off on a limb here saying that you just plug this guy up in order just to save on tooling costs. Either way, the turrets do build up well and have a nice look and feel to them. Here we have the decal sheet. Even though this is an older model, the Dragon decals, I've never really had problems with them on past builds, so I'm not expecting any issues to occur on these ones. The decal sheets of this era were printed in Japan. I'm not sure who the actual company were, but that more likely explains why the quality is as good as they are. On the reverse side, here we have the photo etch like I was referring to before. The photo etch on Dragon Kits of this era are the silver color. And here we have such fittings as brush guards. These are the two front brush guards and the two rear brush guards. These two are the guards for, I believe, the Grouser racks, which are found on the back corners of the Sherman. And this little piece of detail here is for the British pattern of cage antenna base, which I'll touch upon that as the video progresses. Not really sure what that is. Oh, that, I actually do know what that is. That there is the, is the stop for the British loader sash that's found on the Firefly. And it just gets bent to shape and mounted in place. Again, I'll touch more upon that as the build progresses. Going down deeper brings us to the hull runner. Now this is the exact same runner which was mentioned on the M4A4 build. The quality of the tooling is exquisite and this is 100% dragon. There's no tallery found on these sections over here. Note on the 
front section, we have some nice cast texturing found on the mosaic pieces found on the bow. If anyone has ever watched my, my 1.6 scale M4A4 video, you'll know that I mentioned that the front of these Shermans are basically a mosaic of sorts, and some parts are rolled steel and some parts are cast. And the Dragon Kid does a very nice job in illustrating the differences between the two. Note, you also have some really nice rendered uh, torch cut lines found here on the armor plates as well as the other weld beads which are found on the remainder of the vehicle. We also have the British plated over gutter guards which are found here on the bullet splash rim. More information on that of course is to come as the video progresses but yeah it's it's a nice again these kits here really did age very well. It's amazing that these kits here were again tooled up in the mid 1990s and 20s I mean this kit's old enough to buy alcohol at this point and it can still hold its own pretty well with some of the other modern renditions on the market. Here we have the rear engine deck, definitely an M44 with the hump, rear engine hatch, and the lower hull with of course the bottom hump found here. Either mounts, a little bit on the weaker side, these didn't age as well as the remainder of the kit, but overall the model does build up well. This runner here is the suspension, or I should say just the road wheels. And we also have the components to comprise a three-piece transmission cover. Digging deeper brings us to the suspension. Now, like I mentioned earlier when I said that this kit uses exclusively drag and tooling, well, as it turns out, I was mistaken with that comment because this suspension runner here is 100% Italy borrowed. If anyone has ever built the Italeri M4A1 with the 76 or really more or less any other flavor of Italeri Sherman, this runner here should look very, very familiar to you because this is literally the exact same runner off of those kits. The only difference is the color of the plastic and generally the runners are this long on the Italeri because there's a lower hull molded into the section over here. But other than that, this is straight up Italeri tooling. Note the difference options for sprocket teeth where we have the early pattern and the later pattern, final drives, open spoke road wheels, yeah, and even the center of the sprockets have their little sinkholes found in them, which is always something that needs to be addressed if anyone's building the Italeri Sherman. The suspension, being Italeri, also has that form-fitting feature where it has that rocky horse type function, and that's something that can be good or benefit or can be a detriment depending on what you're building your model for. But again, more information on that is to come. But yeah, tallery tooling. And going down further to the bottom of the box takes us to the kryptonite that kept me away from building one of these kits for the longest time, and that's the tracks. You see, although the Dragon kits were very nice and had all those other positive benefits that I mentioned earlier. The biggest thing that absolutely sucked about them were the tracks. From day one, Dragon utilized individual Lincoln Lane track. And we all know how much I love these things. I mean, these things are just awesome. No, they're not. They're crap. I hate these damn tracks. So, they're not going to be utilized. But one positive invention, or I should say development, which came in recent years, was the development of aftermarket replacement tracks. So if you notice on this model here, I went ahead and got a set of single piece vinyl tracks from AFV Club. These are the same tracks that I used on the M4A4 build that I did a little while ago and they worked fantastic on that kit so I don't see there being a problem on this model too. The AFV Club tracks came out in I want to say the early 2000s time frame and they have several different options that are available. Now depending on the Sherman that you're working on, will affect the type of tracks that you can purchase. You see, because this vehicle is not your standard length type hull Sherman, it's actually a long haul vehicle based on the M4A4, you can't use the other track sets that are made. If you notice, this one here is specifically designed for the long haul variant. Because of that, this track will be considerably longer in length compared to the other variants, which if you try to install this on a standard Sherman, you're going to have tracks that aren't going to fit and vice versa. The track pattern on this is the T62, which is the variant that has the three rivets found on the faceplate of the 
Chevron type tracks. And these are the type of tracks that are generally commonly seen on the M4A4 base vehicles, as well as many of the Commonwealth vehicles which were supplied under lend lease. The final bit of detailing you see on the bottom of the, of the box is a replacement barrel. You see, the kit does supply you with its own barrel, but you notice it's a two-piece construction. This type of barrel, again, is definitely doable. However, in order to save time and having to deal with that center seam work, I just simply am going to replace it outright with this unit that we have here. This one here is from Edward, and it's actually an older pattern barrel. I don't think these are in production anymore. In fact, they're as old as this base kit here, as I believe it was actually specifically made for this model. So I think it's a fitting piece to add to this build. On the last Dragon Firefly that I did a number of years ago, I too replaced a barrel on that one with an aftermarket piece, and it worked out and turned out so well that, you know, I don't see why I shouldn't do the same procedure again on this one. Quality of the piece is pretty good. Again, it's kind of dated compared to what we're used to seeing on current kits. The barrel appears to be all one piece CNC'd aluminum, and it does look pretty good again for the era that this barrel was tooled up in. But more information on that is to come once the model is built. Bottom of the box takes us to the instruction manual. Standard Dragon CAD drawings of the era. Not gonna have to worry about that nonsense, so. But other than that, yeah, I don't see any problem with this, and this model here should pan out to be a fairly quick build. All the way on the bottom, finally brings us to a color chart that has all the other options and renditions that this kit can be built with, with the stock decals that are supplied. Well, here we have the model now, going through its final building phases and entering into painting and, pr and final completion. The hull, as you can see here, has been primed and has been painted on its lower extremities for reasons that are very commonly stated on this channel, just to, so that everything gets a thorough coat of painting, so you don't have any gaps in the paint if you look at the tank in certain angles, specifically on the suspension. Same also applies to the suspension as well. Here we have the trucks, now fully assembled. And, of course, everything was pre-painted, which is why they get assembled at this point. And it's also at this point here where I go ahead and conduct some seam removal. As, just like what is common on pretty much all Sherman tanks with the VVSS in kit form, you are going to have a seam that runs across this portion over here where the two halves of the housing conjoined together. Well, you can see that on these units, I went ahead and did the bodywork with some red putty. If we get that in focus, you can also see that the red putty also acts as a little bit of cast texturing and it smooths everything over on the top portion in the and on the front face over here. And you can also see that I went ahead and added four holes on the front portions. These were added with a pin vise and what these holes are for is that on the real Sherman the housing is a reversible unit and basically what separates a left from a right hand unit is just the orientation where the return roller bracket and the skid rail bracket get mounted. If you put it on the right hand side they go on this type of format and on the left hand side you just simply swap them out. Well because of that if the pieces are not going to be used you're going to have the fastener holes still found in these locations, and these are absent on just about all of the 135th scale Shermans that are on the market. In order to add these, it's quite simple. Right here, pin vise, small dremel bit. It's really all that's necessary. I basically just eyeball it and just drill the, or put a little dimple on all four of these locations, which greatly increases the accuracy of the model. Now you'll notice that the pieces are pretty thoroughly painted. So from here, they can be mounted to the side of the hull and then the entire hull gets a second coat which will thoroughly coat the remainder of the exposed areas found on the suspension. And then, of course, the remainder of the hull will get painted as well. Another cautionary thing I want to point out for anyone assembling one of these Dragon VVSS Sherman, specifically one of these older pattern ones, and you know what, the same thing is actually true for the Timia as well. 
is with the row wheel orientation. You'll notice that on these older kits here, the back portion of the row wheels are completely hollow and void of any sort of detailing. Now, while this is not really a problem for the kit, where it becomes an issue is when you're assembling the suspension, you can easily mount the unit on in reverse. And if this happens and you don't catch it, you're gonna be pretty much screwed. You have to go ahead and try to pry the housing open, probably cause some damage, and it's just, it adds a lot more complications. So you have to pay attention to this, and this is specifically true for these Italeri pattern of suspensions because frankly, you know, there's a lot of parts. You have the wheels, and you have the swing arms, and the H-frames, which all get assembled, and then from there they get mounted to the housing. On the Tamiya, these three pieces here are one molding, so it's less likely you can make that screw up, but it is something that can happen when you get complacent. You're just going through the motions, sliding the wheels on, the next thing you know, oh crap, I have the back portion of the wheel sticking out. Now I gotta go ahead and screw something up to fix it. So keep that in mind when you're going through your builds. Complacency will always do you in. And from here this now takes to the model now fully completed and we'll start with the suspension components. Adding upon what I mentioned before, here you can see the suspension parts now fully painted and weathered and fitted to the vehicle. Note the four holes that I mentioned before and you can see how they really stick out now and it, again it's one of those little spices you can add to your VVSS Sherman that will greatly improve it compared to just, you know, leaving it stock without the holes present. Another thing I want to point out is with this suspension here, you'll probably notice from the previous scene, but I actually went ahead and glued the swing arms solid to the housings. Why this is important is because this vehicle does utilize an Italeri semi-functional suspension system, one effect that this has is that if you put on a set of vinyl type tracks, the tension is generally pretty tight on these, so what will happen is that the suspension in the front and the suspension in the rear will bend upward in either direction, giving you the Italeri smile or the rocking horse bend. This is something that can hurt the look of the build, so in order to just remove that from the equation altogether, I just simply glued all of the swing arms solid in their locations. This is going to be true if you use the crappy static Lincoln Lake tracks that are supplied with the kit, or if you went with the Galaxy Brain single piece vinyl tracks like I used on this build here. The only time when the rocking horse situation is not going to be present is if you go ahead and utilize a workable track link option from companies like AFV Club, Master Club, Fruly, you name it. There's a plethora of aftermarket workable track link options out there for VVSS Shermans and most of them are really 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 good but that's really a discussion for another video. For this one here you can see how the single piece AFV Club vinyl tracks went on with this build and these went on without any problems whatsoever. Now like I stated with the M4A4 video where I use these same tracks on that build these tracks here, when it comes time for painting them, you want to avoid at all costs utilizing just standard off-the-shelf rattle can spray paint. The spray paints can cause one, or have the potential to cause one of two problems. First, depending on the company who makes the paint, the chemicals in that paint can be somewhat harsh and can potentially hurt the, the finish and the detailings that are integrally molded into the track surfaces. Another situation that can happen is after a while you'll have the tracks painted, weathered, and mounted to the vehicle. And then after a year or two, the tracks can have a, uh, a negative chemical reaction with the paint and the tracks can just fall apart and crumble on you. Neither situation is really ideal. So to paint these tracks as well as all of my single piece vinyl tracks that you see on my builds, I utilize Tamiya acrylics. The Tamiya acrylic paint airbrushes on and so far from what I've seen on a large number of my older builds right now is that the tracks are holding up very well. I haven't seen any problems with the models aging where the tracks dry out or crumble or anything like that like I mentioned which can't possibly happen with the spray painted tracks that I've touched upon in a few videos. Now for the actual colors that I used to paint the track for this type of pattern here I went with one of two type of options. You can use either Tamiya NATO Black or Tamiya Rubber Black. Both colors are very similar in their shades and will basically lead you to the same end result. Now the T62 track, which of course is the type of track that this model here represents, would be an all steel type track. And the way you see it weathered is pretty much standard on the majority of my builds. 
I just take some silver paint and I dry brush it onto these surfaces here, giving them the relief and the highlights that you see. And hopefully this comes through, but you'll see here on the inner track portion, it's a lot cleaner compared to the outer extremities. On the real Shermans, if you ever seen one that has been driven for a little bit, the inner track sections are actually remarkably pretty clean and that's because the wheels both the metal steel idler as well as the rubber rim row wheels do a pretty good job in rubbing down and basically acting like a pencil eraser cleaning off the inner track pads from any sort of dirt or corrosion which typically can accumulate over time. Now just like the other M4A4 build that I just did the AFE Club tracks are 100% recommended for your Dragon kits. They are awesome. They went on perfectly with the timing. You'll notice that they time flawlessly with the Italeri or the Dragon type sprockets and again are everything that you're looking for for a aftermarket replacement track. On the rear section here, one modification that I did to this build that I had to do later on to the A4 towards the end of the build was with the idler mounts. You see this track here one thing that it does have going for it is that the tension is on the tight end. So the parts do fit on, but one thing I learned on the A4 build was after the tracks were fitted, there was so much tension that it was actually prying on the rear idler mount that we have here and was pulling it off of the model. On that build, I mentioned how I repaired it by adding some more super glue into that section as well as a metal pin. On this one here, since I already knew that that was a potential problem, I went ahead and reinforced this area with more super glue during the build. Because I added extra super glue to these sections, this component here was more beefed up and was much more sturdy compared to the last build that I did. So when the tracks went on, the addition of that bolt was, or that little pin was unnecessary because it could hold up with the track tension just fine. And of course, it wouldn't be an ECA Sherman build if I didn't point out that, yes, the Zerk grease fittings have been painted in red. There are two on each of the row wheels. You can see on this one over here, and of course, there's another one right there on the opposite side. The Zerk fittings are also painted red here on the return rollers. Don't get confused with the large hole that we have here that are molded in. The Zerk fittings are the smaller ones found on these rollers. And the same is also true for the rear idler wheel as well. Another thing that I usually point out, and this is specifically true for VVSS Shermans, and it's a common mistake that a lot of folks make out there, is they misunderstand that the idler, as well as the return rollers, are rubber rimmed like the main row wheels. That is not the case on Shermans with the VVSS. VVSS quip tanks, this component, as well as these components here, are made out of metal, and so you'll notice that I weathered them accordingly. Of course, because they are constantly spinning and making contact with the teeth as well as the pad here on the track, the paint that would be found on these surfaces would wear off very, very quickly, leading for a polished look like you see here. Moving our way back to the sprockets, these are the kit supplied sprockets that were mentioned earlier and are Italeri pattern, which means they are made of four components. They all assemble into the sprocket that we have here. The pieces assemble very well, and this kit does have that cool option where you can switch between the early pattern or the late pattern of sprocket tooth. This really depends on your personal choice and your preference on which one you want to go with. They go together pretty well, but one thing I do have to point out that you have to be careful with on these Italeri pattern sprockets is you want to make sure that the sprocket rings are thoroughly glued to the center hubs. Because of the switchable nature, you install these pieces on basically by adding a drop of glue to each and every one of these little spokes that we have here. If you're a little bit stingy on the glue, the piece can potentially buckle on you when you mount on a single piece track like this, because again, keep in mind of that tension that we have here. If the pieces aren't strong, they'll just cave in on themselves, which is not really something you want to have. On the flip side, you don't want to go overzealous with the glue where it's a giant glob and that's not exactly helping matters either. You want to have that nice sweet spot in the middle. In addition to that, another thing you want to watch out for is the track sprocket timing. You see, because these are two separate components, this has the potential of the sprocket tooth rings being slightly off center with each other, which will cause issues when you mount on the tracks because the, the tooth sections are not going to properly index in their corresponding notches. And this is something that could lead to issues as well. 
Now, fortunately, with the way the kit is designed, there is a key and groove type system on the on the tooth rings as well as the hub, so they do interlock pretty well with each other. But you do want to keep in mind that there's still a slight amount of play that can happen, so you want to just pay attention when you're building these pieces and make sure that the parts are properly indexed. You do all of that, you should be good to go. One last thing I want to mention on the sprockets before I move on is with the center hub. You see, the Italery pattern sprockets have this interesting quirk where there's a sinkhole found directly in the center portion here. Now this isn't necessarily an inaccuracy because on the real VVSS Shermans and actually the HVSS Shermans as well, on the center of the hub there is a small little dimpled recess just like you see it on this model. So in order to improve the Italeri piece a little bit further is just with a pin vise with a small Dremel bit you just clean out the hole because of course with the way it comes standard it is a sinkhole so it kind of looks like a like an inverted cone on the inside there so by clearing it out with the pin vise you get a more machined look to it and it looks less like a pinhole and more like the way it should on the real vehicle moving our way to the rear plate takes us to two small changes that I made to this kit the first involves this little grab handle that I have here the kit does have this detailing present but it's just an integral molded blade which is pretty much standard on a lot of 135th scale kits out there. In order to improve it further I just went ahead and polished away the molded in unit and drilled two small new holes in its place which then I went ahead and replaced it with a new handle that was fabricated out of thin wire. From the handle takes to the toe points and these are integrally molded into the bottom plate here of this kit and like I said in the A4 video this is present on all of the older school Dragon stretched out hull Sherman kits that are out there. For the M4A4 it was a bit of an issue because that vehicle would not have these toe points but for the Firefly here that's not the case. The pieces of course were kept but in order to improve them further with a small bit I went ahead and drilled out these four locations giving the model a little bit more accuracy as opposed to just leaving them molded solid. And this was also done to the two front toe points as well. With the way the three-piece transmission goes together you have to do this before you go ahead and actually start the construction of this component because once the unit starts going together you're not going to be able to get in here with the Dremel or even with a pin vise in order to do this procedure so this should be one of the first things you get to do otherwise you're going to miss the boat on that one. The three-piece transmission cover is actually one of the more difficult aspects of this kit to put together. The pieces themselves go together pretty well but where the difficulty comes in is when it comes time to fit the transmission cover to the lower hull and have it mate with the upper armor plate. I also encountered this situation on the other Dragon M4A4 kit that I recently completed. In order to get the piece to mount onto the model, it's not really too difficult. It just requires a little bit of hand fitting and patience in order to get the component fit into the proper location. What this entails is that on this top portion here where the transmission cover meets the armored plate, you need to remove a slight bit amount of material in this section over here on the front glasses plate with a thin needle file. Just a few passes is really all that's needed, but you have to be very careful not to over remove some material or you don't remove material in an uneven format where you have a diagonal type cut forming on you. You have to, this is the type of thing where you have to remove a little bit of material test fit the part and adjust accordingly. If you take your time and you're careful with it, you'll remove just amount enough material in order to have the component slide into place without there being any real obtrusive gap or seam found on this top section here of the front armor plate. In addition to the cast texturing, another bit of detailing that I added was with the front fender supports. The kit does have these integrally molded on, but I found them to be a little bit too thin in my opinion and when you fit them on they don't exactly cover the front transmission section over here and on this build I had a small little gap so much so that I went ahead and just straight up replaced them all together the stock ones were amputated and sanded flush and then I fabricated two new ones out of thin pieces of aluminum this bit of detailing is basically identical to the ones that you see on my 1 6 scale Sherman builds but it's just of course shrunk down to 135. By doing this it does give the model a little bit more detailing since the thin aluminum is much more to scale compared to the plastic units that were originally molded in and they have their appropriate size to them which thoroughly covers up 
any gaps which would be found on the section where the fender overlaps onto the transmission cover. Moving along to the other bow details takes us to the headlights as well as the brush guards. These are both the kit supplied units and were mounted as is. One thing I want to point out about the brush guards that's really cool though is like I mentioned before these are made from metal photo etch parts which is something that's a really interesting attribute that this kit has and again it's something that really makes it a bit ahead of its time. This is something that would be seen on more modern kits or it's something that would have to be acquired as an aftermarket option which is not the case on this model here. The pieces are nice and thin they bend together pretty well but if you don't have any background with working with photo etch they may be a bit difficult for you to get the grasp of. Like I stated before the brush guards bend together pretty well. One tip in how to bend them is you take a 764 drill bit and you basically just bend the center portion around each side. This will give you the shape that we have here of the Sherman's brush guard. One detail that of course is basically absolutely mandatory on Sherman brush guards are the little canisters found on each end here for the headlight guards. This little canister like I frequently mention is used to keep a little plunger in this section here when the headlight is installed. When the headlights are removed this little plunger goes in this hole here and it prevents more water moisture from entering inside the vehicle. When not in use the plunger would be housed in this little canister which is why all Shermans have these little canisters welded to the side portions here of the brush guards and it's one of those things that it's basically Sherman law you have to have it. On this small here I fabricate on two small sections of sixteenth of an inch shrink tubing that I shrink onto a small metal wire and then I snip to the appropriate size and just glue them to their appropriate locations. It's one of those things that when you add it to your build it's one of the polishing points that helps improve it compared to leaving it stock. From the lights, this now brings us to the siren. The siren is the kit original unit and like many early Shermans, mounts directly here to the front fender. The one modification that I made was the addition of the power cable which comes out of the hull and enters into the side portion here of the siren. This was just fabricated out of a thin piece of floor wire and two little holes were drilled via pin vise into the hull and into the siren in order to achieve this detailing. From there, this now brings us to the spare tracks and this is one of those British modifications that was made to the vehicle because the British design of spare track racks are completely different compared to the ones found on the American tanks. Of course on the American tanks they would be mounted on the rear and would have this hinge type system to it. The British went with a slightly different format. They had this cage looking like device where it is hinged, you remove a fastener and the entire piece hinges out of the way and on each side and this allows you to get access to the links themselves. Moving to the side, you can see here the weld detailing that I added on this portion here. Just like with the A4, the welds are there, but they're very, very lightly molded. And in order to improve the model further, I went ahead and sculpted new welds out of red putty. This was done on both sides, and once added, really gives the side of the model a bit of extra kick. I believe I also went ahead and improved the torch cut lines found on this section here of the vehicle. Of course, this is a mirror image on the opposite side. Moving along takes us to the side skirt mounts and just like with a large number of 135 scale Shermans this kit's no different where the rail is integrally molded into the upper hull and it renders it as just a straight continuous piece all the way from front to aft. On the real Sherman this would be made from three separate strips. The one on the front and the rear are shorter in length and the main span one is quite considerable in size. The piece also doesn't have any holes that are integrally molded in and all of these holes here were added via a pin vise and a very small bit. This is a type of procedure where if you don't have the tooling for it you just might want to avoid it because you can easily screw this up and it can be a ding on your build. In addition to the holes you'll also see that I added these segment cuts found on the front and rear section right there as well as right here. And this also helps improve the look of the model, giving it a little bit more accuracy and realism. The cuts were just added with a small exacto and were carefully carved into the sections that you see here. Moving afterward takes to the rear detailing, starting with the rear dimpy fenders. 
These components here are kit supplied and are a carryover from the M4A4. It wouldn't be uncommon to see Fireflies or A4s in the field that have these fenders pitched because I can tell you firsthand from my 1.6 scale one, these components here are really susceptible to damage from dirt and debris getting kicked up by the tracks. They bend, ding up pretty easily. So it, there's a reason why they were pitched in real life. The box that we have here is another kit supply component and is one of the Firefly specific parts that are supplied with this kit. All of these components here went out without any problems and when are fitted they actually look pretty good. From the box takes to the tail lights, these are the kit supplied units and are nicely rendered out of the box and were simply mounted as is. Of course note on this one here it is blacked out which is a common feature found on these American pattern of AFE tail lights. Just like with the ones on the front, we have metal PE brush guards, and they also assembled and bent to shape very easily. While on the PE, you can see the grouser rack, or I should say the grouser storage compartment vent, has its little grill present, and these just drop directly in place. And again, it's another nice feature that are found on these Dragon M44 pattern of kits. From the vent, this now takes to the fire extinguisher, and this modification here is a very British modification, and it's found on just about all of the British Shermans that were supplied via the Lend Lease. The fire extinguisher itself is the kit supplied unit, and is actually really nicely detailed out of the box. The only thing that is needed by the builder is to paint it in order to really make it pop. Notice on this vehicle here, the fire extinguisher is painted in red. The and fitting is brass, and then there's just a metal strap that secures it to the vehicle. All these details are molded in, and just with a little swipes of paint here and there, it's all that's needed to really make them pop. Now, in case you don't want to paint yours red, there these extinguishers came in a few different colors. Red was one of them, and I believe one was a dark olive drab color, and I believe black, if I'm not mistaken. However, for this model here, I went with the red because it really makes it stand out, and it's just one of those eye-catching features that are found on these British vehicles. On a similar note, this now takes to the gun cleaning staves, and this is another Firefly specific component. Because of the longer 17 pounder gun, the vehicle needed a longer set of cleaning staves. The British went ahead and fabricated this setup that we have here, where we have the wooden poles that are held in place via the metal bucket that would be on this side, and these two sections here would be a canvas strap which would tie them down further. Just like with most AFV cleaning staves, the tips here are made from brass. So when you're building and painting your model, in order to make it sh really pop, all you gotta do is take a swipe of brass or gold paint, paint these end fittings here, and your staves will look much better because of it. The remainder of the Pioneer tools are left totally stock and were simply mounted as is. Of course, when you come time to mounting these components, you want to make sure that the metal parts, which would be attached to the tank, are painted with the same color as the tank, while the securing straps would either be leather or a webbing type material, and so you would paint them accordingly. For this model here, I went with the webbing approach, which is why they're a slightly different green compared to the remainder of the vehicle. As for what's metal and what's webbing, your best bet is to go on the internet and find some pictures of these Shermans that have their tools fitted on, and within a minute or two you'll know exactly which strap does what. From the tools takes to the fuel filler spouts, and on this build, just like with the rest of my Sherman builds, I went ahead and drilled out the little drainage hole that is found on the armor collar. This of course is done to both sides and this is done with a pin vise and a small dremel bit. This little bit of detailing is absent on just about all Sherman kits on the market and it's one that once added does improve the look without really doing a whole lot of extra work on your end. The fuel dripping you can see on these sections here that was simulated with paint. And when it comes to the fluids on the Sherman, it would be as follows. These two fuel caps here would be for gasoline. Of course, the M44 was a gasoline-powered vehicle. The center filler cap here would be for the radiator fluid, and that's why it has this large hump that we have here, because the radiator was so large. It needed a cover cap for both the top as well as the bottom hull. The last filler spout is this unit that we have over here, which on the real vehicle would be for the refueling of the Little Joe Auxiliary Generator, and that unit utilizes pre-mixed gasoline. Just like with the 
collars on either side here that protect the fuel filler spout. There would be another drainage hole found on these two sections right here and here. But one interesting attribute found on the Chrysler made A4s is that they put this metal plate here to protect the drainage hole. I guess they figured that this was potentially a weak point and somehow someone got a lucky shot right into this drainage hole here and caused problems with the turret. So they welded this little plate on either end. On the model here, the plate is integrally welded to the collar. So you're not going to really be able to drill the hole in this section, but you'll notice the way I weathered it, I have the streaks coming from either side of it, just to simulate if there was a drainage hole there. Moving our way to the front bow hatches, the details on here are nicely done out of the box, where the kit has separate molded handles that get glued into these two sections here, and they do have some nice spring detailing found on either side here of the hatch. The brush guards that you see here, however, are not supplied with the kit. These are an aftermarket accessory that were acquired from Shapeways and are 3D printed. I have the link listed in the video description below, and these are recommended for just about anyone who builds 135th scale American-based vehicles. They will work on a Sherman, Stewart, Pershing, you name it, these brush guards would be present. These brush guards are also generally missing on the majority of the 135th scale kits on the market, so they just drop in place and give you a nice little bit of detailing. Moving our way up takes us to probably one of my favorite tool parts on this entire kit, and that's the turret. The turret is basically the same tooling that was seen on the A4 kit, but in this version here has the Firefly cutouts for the British pattern of loader's hatch. All of the pieces are nicely rendered and the tar does have a nice rough casted look to it out of the box. Now just like with the M4A4 kit, this one was also needing the same hand fitting procedure done to the turret halves in regards on how they secure to the vehicle. See if I take the turret off for a second it gives you a better way to see what I'm talking about. Right here, with the way the two halves go together, there's a bit of plastic found in these two locations. And if you assemble the model out of the box, you're not going to be able to fully rotate the turret when it fits onto the hull. In order to make, make the turret fit better, with a Dremel and a high-speed removal bit, I was able to just remove a bit of material found in these two sections over here. And after a while, with some testing you'll be able to remove enough material where the tar can then fit and rotate on the vehicle properly. After this was done a little bit of bodywork was done in order to blend in the texturing found in these two sections here with the remainder of the turret. While with the turret off you can also see the added welds that I have on the counterweight section that is found on the back portion of the Firefly. On the Firefly there would actually be a radio housing this section over here and it also acted as a double duty in order to give the turret a little bit of a counterweight to remedy the long gun barrel that we have here. The kit components here are stock and were assembled out of the box without any mods in terms of assembly and installation. However the only addition that I did make was with the welds found in this area over here. Of course this was a British modification and you would have some pretty substantial size welds conjoining these two pieces together much similar to what we saw in the bow with the M1919 plug. From the counterweight now takes us to the antenna bases. Now on this vehicle the kit supplies you with a nice set of British pattern of AFE antenna bases. Of course on the A4 this was one of the things I had to change but for this one here because it's a British pattern of vehicle the stock antenna bases are perfectly usable. First and foremost on the well here of the antenna base mount I went ahead and drilled it out as we generally see a drainage hole found in this section here and there's another small hole found in this portion here on the secondary antenna base mount. On the well we have the British pattern of rubber conical antenna base which is integrally molded into the turret. In order to secure the wire I simply drill this center portion out with a pin vise and this allows me to install a wire. For the secondary cage antenna base, it supplies you with a plastic component for the main center section, which gets drilled out again for the antenna base. But the cage here is made from a piece of photo etch, and it's a very nicely designed piece from Dragon. It may be a bit on the difficult end for a novice or a person who does not really have a good grasp on working with PE to install and fabricate, but 
on this piece here, I was able to assemble it pretty well. The piece bends, you have to bend it around a round shape object. And then in order to secure the two heads in place, I actually solder them so that they stay together. This is something that if you try using super glue with, you may have some success with, but I've always found solder is the best way to go for this type of a procedure and a little drop and the pieces then permanently held in place. The rest of the cage has these integral bends that are found in the PE and you just with a plier, you just carefully bend the pieces accordingly and then the piece just slips directly over the plastic section on these molded in sections and your cage setup is all taken care of. The only other thing I want to point out is with the antenna wires themselves, the middle sections here are painted in brass, which is what you would generally see on the real antennas found on the real vehicle. Here you can see the brass painted sections in more light. And this now leads us to the loader's hatch, which is all comprised out of kit components, no mods being made. One other thing that the kit does supply you with is this nice little PE bracket over here, which is used to secure the rubber bump stop on that of course would prevent the hinge from over traveling. The rubber bump stop is made from plastic and simply glues to the PE, which you have to bend to shape, but the instructions do have the method of bending of the piece, you know, the shape. They do have it pretty well illustrated inside the instructions. So if you follow the instructions, you should be okay. Moving forward takes us to another one of those 3D printed brush guards. And then we have here the smoke grenade launcher. This is the kit supplied unit and is integrally molded into the turret. The only modification that I made is with a drill bit, I just drilled this section out, which gives the piece a little bit more depth and a little bit more accuracy. Moving along, the rest of the turret takes us to the cupola. Cupola is stock with the kit. One interesting thing though that is found on these Dragon early pattern of M44 kits is that the cupola for some reason has two antenna bases that are molded in. Obviously this is not the case and one of these units needs to be amputated in order to get the appropriate look. As for why they did this, your guess is as good as mine. If I was to take a guess, I would say that they did this because the cupola locks onto the turret in a certain format with a peg and groove type system. So if you want to have the model replicating the machine gun mounted on the back portion, as if the cupola was rotate, because this can rotate freely on the real vehicle, you would simply just reverse the hatches so that this periscope would be on this side, and then you can have the machine gun pointing in this direction, and then you still remove the other one, and there you would go, but this is purely speculative because there's no information on it. What is known is that there is a secondary machine gun mount here, and that is 100% not correct on any Sherman tank that I've ever seen. So for your model, if you have one of these older kits, amputate this section completely. This is just polished away with some needle files and some sandpaper. Use a Dremel with a high-speed removal bit if need be, but whatever you do, get rid of that machine gun mount because it is just an eyesore and it's just not needed at all. Other than that, you can see the little grab handle found on here. I believe this is a piece of metal wire that I added in place for a little bit better accuracy. The piece, I believe, had a molded in one and I was just simply removed like I mentioned before. And this now takes to the periscope, which is a nicely detailed piece because it comes in two pieces. You have an internal periscope insert as well as the hinged top portion here. So you can model the piece either in the closed or open position. The piece here is one of the last components that I mount to the model because it's easier to go ahead and paint the periscope lens and prism detailing before it gets mounted to the vehicle and then everything gets inserted, the top piece gets fitted, and you're all good to go. And that now leads us to the cherry on this vehicle, which of course is the M2 HB 50 caliber machine gun. Like I stated in another Sherman video, it is basically law that you must have a browning pattern machine gun mounted to the top of your Sherman. It's just, that's just the case. And on this vehicle here, the kit does not supply you with the anti-aircraft machine gun. The example of the M2 HB on this model is a Tamiya piece left over from an M48 a3 patent kit. If anyone has ever built that Tamiya kit, you'll know that you have a few machine gun options. And needless to say, this one here I had in the stash. What's nice about that kit is that, or I should say with that setup, is that the M2HB is mounted on the M23 cradle, which is a World War II pattern cradle and can easily just be mounted to a World War II pattern vehicle without any other modifications. The 50 itself is decently modeled by Tamiya. I drilled out the 
muzzle section here with a small pin vise, which is again customary on my build. The piece also has the ammo can with the lid removed, which by the way is common on those 50 cal ammo cans. They can, they are removable. And you have some nice rendered detail of the ammunition found on the inside. For the ammunition, like I mentioned in a very recent video that I just did on a 16 1919, the way it's painted is you have the projectiles on the front painted copper, you have the disintegrating link belt painted in black, and then you have the remainder of the brass casings painted in, well, gold or brass. Like I said in that other video, gold paint does a pretty good job with replicating brass casings, and that's basically the format that you see here. Of course, the grips are painted to replicate red Bakelite, as is the charging handle, which it's here. It's a small little stub. It's not really that large on these older M2s from Tamiya, but a little drop of paint is there, you know, highlighting whatever nub is really left. From the 50, this now takes to the main artillery, which is a 17-pounder. Now, like I mentioned before, this model utilizes both kit original as well as aftermarket pieces in order to flesh this unit out. On the mantlet, this was left totally stock. I don't remember any mods I needed to have made to it, and it's even nice because Dragon has the Coax 1919 here, pre-molded hollow, which is a really nice feature indeed. The mantlet, or I should say the rotor drum, has those nice internal slits that was seen earlier, but they are molded solid. On this model, just like on the A4, I went ahead and hollowed them out with a Dremel and a needle file. And in case anyone's wondering why, well, if you look on the inside here, you can see for yourself that you do get a glimpse of those hollowed out sections. And it's one of those things that does improve the look of the build overall. For the barrel itself, this is the aluminum turn barrel from Edward. And like I stated earlier, this is a vintage kit in its own right. And it's funny because it's paired with this vintage kit here, which... You know, it's basically meant to be like two peas in a pod. The barrel is literally meant for this tank, so the unit is a direct replacement for the stock kit barrel. If anyone's wondering exactly why I did it, well, like I showcased before, the stock original barrel is a two-part barrel assembly, which means you are going to have that center seam to contend with. It's not impossible. It's basically customary on all these builds, but if you have the option to just swap it out for a metal one, really, why not? And this now leads us to the paint and the markings. This model here is painted with a completely different set of paints compared to what is typically seen on the other American-based vehicles that are seen on this channel. The British had their own system of greens and drabs that they use on their tanks, so having it painted differently is one of the ways you can make your British tanks stand out in your collection from your other American counterparts. Of course, being a Firefly, I like to paint the barrel in this type of configuration where we have this little wavy muff line, which on um, the real vehicle was done in order to camouflage it, concealing the fact that it's a Firefly because the German gunners would specifically target the Fireflies because they were a greater threat. You'll notice that the camouflage stops short right here because this here would be the length of your standard 75mm Sherman. The barrel camouflage came in a few different configurations. I've seen some that are smooth and wavy like this one, to triangles, to there's even one that has like a big square located over here. There were lots of different ways that this was accomplished in order to conceal the long barrel of the 17 pounder. There are also a few different colors as well. This one has a two tone where the end of the, or I should say, this portion of the barrel is painted in black. And then you have the wavy line here. The wavy line is painted with a paintbrush, which again, it would be seen on many examples in the field. Others would just have the wavy line without the black painted. So again, there are lots of options available to you, the builder, in exactly how you render out your Firefly. Moving on back takes to the markings. Now this kit does supply you with a few different options on exactly what type of vehicle you can render. One of which is a very famous Sherman Firefly, which of course is the one that's credited for knocking out Michael Whitman. But in order to make the vehicle with that representation, I would have to make a few other additions and modifications to the kit that are not found on this starter model. So rather than going with that approach, I just went with one of the other options that were supplied on the decal sheet. Of course, the markings on this model are your standard water slide decals. And one thing that was true about this kit, and is actually a trait I've seen on several other old vintage Dragon kits I've built over the years, is that when it comes to the kit supply decals, they are extremely well done. 
these decals were a joy to work with. They went into the water just fine, they applied just fine, and they lacquer on even better. There's no silvering, there's no other imperfections that you generally see on other poor quality decals, no flaking, none of that stuff. These decals are amazing. That's one of the highlights on these older Dragon Kits in my opinion. The decals are just, they're awesome. At the end of the day, I am really happy in how this build turned out. This was another one of those kits that I've been wanting to purchase for a long period of time. And now that I finally got it and finally built it, it's one that I really enjoy having in my collection. Despite how old these old school Dragon Sherman kits are, the quality on the kits were so good that they aged really well. These kits here are just as relevant today as they were 20 something years ago when they originally came out. And I guess that now slides us into skill level and recommendation. The kit itself I cannot recommend to a beginner. This is due to several of the components being molded in a very fine and frail way. If you don't have a good concept with working with small detailed pieces like this, this can lead to issues and can possibly cause some problems. The kit suspension, for instance, is one that is definitely going to be a turnoff for most beginners, specifically if you're using those stock individual junk Lincoln Lane tracks. Honestly, I don't recommend them for any person, let alone a beginner. This kit here is really more or less intended for an intermediate to an advanced range builder. An intermediate skill level person can easily tackle one of these models because although several of the components are finely molded, by that point you should have some good tools and good techniques on hand in order to properly remove them off of the sprue, deburr them, and get them properly installed and fitted correctly. And because this is a Dragon kit from the 1990s time frame, I cannot recommend enough the need to replace the stock kit supplied tracks. Either replace them with a set of workable track links from any number of manufacturers or a set of vinyl tracks like I went with here. Either option will be vastly superior compared to the junk individual link tracks that are supplied with this kit. And yes, I know it seems like a bummer that you have to purchase yet another thing just to build the model out of the box. However, with that small little investment of the aftermarket tracks, the complexity of the kit will plummet through the floor, but the quality of the build will skyrocket at the same time. So no matter how you slice it, the replacement of the tracks is one that is extremely beneficial. With the Advanced Minded Builder, this kit here is strongly recommended because it is a great platform to work on to really take it past what the stock original kit gives you. The Sherman is probably the undisputed king in terms of aftermarket detail parts in both terms of just standard detail components as well as conversion sets of all shapes and sizes, as well as in all different type of medias from metal to resin, photo etch, print, you name it. There's going to be something out there, and several options no less, for the M4 Sherman family-based vehicle. The Firefly was one that was heavily used by many countries during the war, as well as even post-World War II. So, if you have a really good imagination, you could cobble together one of these kits into something that's very interesting, as well as pretty unique. Really, part of the fun of Shermans in all scales is you can build the tank your way, where you can go on the more conservative end, where, like I did here, where just a sprinkle of aftermarket parts was added in order to just give the vehicle a more polished rendition of what the out-of-the-box contents are, or you can go on the totally opposite end and come up with one of the more exotic and elaborate versions of the Firefly, like the one with the rockets that were mounted on the sides of the turret, or any other modifications that were made not only by the Brits, but by, again, anyone else who used the Firefly post-World War II. And that basically leads us into recommendations. Of course, if anyone is a die-hard Sherman fan, like, well, yours truly, the 5C Firefly is a no-brainer to add to your collection. And this kit here, like I stated before, is still just as relevant in the year I'm filming this as it was all those years ago when it first came out. Dragon really did hit a home run on this kit, and it really shows it with the level of quality that you see on the kit supply details. Because of this, you don't necessarily have to be a vintage plastic tank kit fan in order to appreciate one of these builds. If you're looking for a British 5C Firefly to add to your collection and you encounter one of these in the wild or on eBay and you can have it for a good price, perhaps it's something that you might want to look into because they just make for really enjoyable builds. 
For competitive options, Dragon themselves released a upgraded version of this variant of the Sherman in the mid-2000s time frame. And outside of Dragon, probably the other two kits that come to mind for me are the Tasca rendition, which from what I understand is an excellent quality kit. And in very recent years, Ryefield models themselves decided to jump into the Sherman bandwagon and release a line of Sherman kits, 5C Firefly included. However, having said that, in my opinion, this old kit here can still keep up with the other new kits that I just mentioned for the majority of uses that you would utilize one of those kits for. If you're looking for a standard static display 5C Firefly or something to throw into a diorama with, that's not using a full interior or anything like that, one of these old Dragon kits here basically is still just as viable and is still a competitive option to think about. Another individual who I would recommend this kit to would be anyone who is an avid fan of World War II armor, World War II allied armor, and because of the subject matter, obviously anyone who likes and collects British or Commonwealth pattern of vehicles. And like I touched upon before, because this model here is 20-something years old, if you're the type of person that likes to build and collect vintage model kits, well, there's yet another reason why you would want one of these in your stash and or collection. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale Sherman 5C Firefly. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content being 135th scale model showcase videos like this guy over here or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in the loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular build as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that frequently get posted to this channel. Finally, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again on the next one.